Here at Spooky 30s, we all have very good heads on our shoulders. And another one on our production desk. Welcome to Spooky 30s, a podcast where I, Stella Cheeks, a 30-something of questionable taste, invite my friends on to turn me into the horror-obsessed fangirl I look like but never was. Each episode, my special guest picks a horror property that I just have to know. We watch it, read a bunch of cultural criticism, both peer-reviewed and publicly published, praise be to the internet scholars and the Tumblr historians, and then we have, hopefully, a super interesting conversation for your ear holes, which I still love saying. My special guest this month is a Chicago drag queen known for being super gross and super sexy, and one of my very best friends, Rosemary Maybe. Yay, hello. Are you freaking out right now? A little bit. <laughs> You're so funny. I never talk in Ro- my acts. Rosie took this very seriously. She's I... like full grad school librarian here. <laughs> I have a master's in library science. <laughs> you tell me to research something, I'm going to fucking research it. Yeah, it was great. She kept sending me articles and Google Docs and Google folders. Yeah. Anyways, I realized in the shower today when I was here to, uh, when I was doing prep for it, I was like, it's weird that I start this po- uh, podcast off so aggressively being like, how do you know me? <laughs> but also, like, why did I invite you? But also, that is um, pretty on brand with my personality. So how do you know me, Rosemary? Maybe. I mean, it makes sense. I God, how long has it been since I've known you? Maybe 10 years? The first time I ever met you was at a Ties and Tassel show. Jeez. And I think me and Bobby were doing our Oogie Boogie act. And Sounds you were right. doing your Hanukkah act. Oh, my God. So you saw me <laughs> twerking to an Israeli rap song <laughs> while Quirella poured Manischewitz over my ass. Yeah. And we got ready in that, like, oh bar room stock room. Uh-huh. And it was in the stock room of Lizards. Yeah, so I've known you since whenever that show Jeez. was. Jeez. <laughs> and like everyone else, I thought for a long time that you fucking hated me. It's just the the eyebrows. It's the vibe. <laughs> but yeah, then we, I think I did your show a few times and we kind of became friends through fandom stuff, I guess. Oh, we kind of became friends through fandom I, stuff? I, I don't know. I don't want to unleash. <laughs> for those of you who follow along with my slow descent into madness on the internet and other podcasts, please check out Xtrix Pod. Rosemary is almost wholly responsible for getting me into fanfic. Yay! I have, I want to frame that. I think I (laughs) scrolled through like a year's worth of messages from you. The first one being like two years ago when you said, I'm not super into fanfic. And then a later one that says, so I'm reading Supernatural Omega version now. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I'm going to frame that and give it to you one day. I'll put it up here in the podcast studio. It's very funny. Look, I was scarred in college reading a really like upsetting Dr. Donna fic. And I was like, I think fanfic's just not for me. (laughs) It's because Dr. Donna sucks. Well, yeah, because they like, they're friends. They're friends. They should not kiss. She's way too good for him. She's way too good. For Donna's him. too good for all of us. Yeah, it's true. No, I I basically like discovered my sexuality and learned anything I know about sex through Spuffy fanfic on my Gateway 2000 in my house at my parents when I lived in Skokie. Man, you just like looked off into the distance, like <laughs> that Gateway 2000 had a picture of like a shirtless James Marsters like doing pull ups and stuff. Yeah, that's on brand for you. Yeah, that's very on brand. <laughs> so that's how we know each yeah. other. What is your relation to the horror genre? Obviously, this podcast is me being like, I was a widow baby one time, and now I love spooky shit. Well, I, similarly to you, look like I should really like horror, but I also am a little tiny baby. <laughs> I think I can, I think I can like trace the exact time that I became a tiny baby. We were going to see a movie in a movie theater when I was a preteen, and there was a trailer for the movie Evolution starring Eddie Murphy. Is um, that a comedy? Yes, but the thing is, a bug crawled under his skin, and you can see it moving around, and I freaked the fuck out, and we had to go and see Anastasia instead. We had to, like, literally (laughs) switch theaters. I said no, and I we left. So, yeah, I don't like scary things. I don't like things that are actually scary. I love camp. Camp, obviously. You're a drag queen. That makes a lot of sense. And, like, gothic-y stuff. Yes. Camp and gothic shit. Totally love actual scary movies. Not for me at all. Which is funny because your wife is very into super scary shit. My wife is obsessed with scary stuff. She'll do 31 days of horror where she watches a horror movie every day in Halloween at the end of October. She like is like, oh my God, I'm just so anxious all the time. I just so <laughs> feel so awful. 
And I'm like, Jesus, what the, why? I wonder. For this season of Spooky 30s, a lot of people are picking stuff that I, I can look up objectively without knowing, without having watched it and kind of know about it and be like, oh, I think I can handle it. Mm-hmm. And the one that she picked, I'm like, I think that's going to be rough. No. When we were first <laughs> dating, she showed me this Italian horror movie and I wanted a th- called Wreck, R-E-C. I've obviously um, never heard no. of that or seen it. <laughs> it's a either Italian or Spanish and it's actually scary as shit. And we were first dating, and I wanted to be like real cool and real chill cool about guy. it. Was not. I want to be real regular about <laughs> this. Regular about it. But no, stuff stays with me all the time. So yeah, I can't handle actual scary things. Well, what one did you pick for us to watch today, Rosemary? Something that is not actually <laughs> scary, but actually fantastic, which is Reanimator. What is your relationship to this property? So I was first shown Reanimator and pretty much any campy or horror movies at all that I've ever seen by my surrogate big brother Chris who I met when I was doing Rocky Horror and he stage drove on me when I was sitting in the audience which is a great meeting for anyone and we became close and he showed me like this Return of the Living Dead and a few others and they were just really really fun and silly and campy and not what I thought horror movies were Hmm. And it was before I had come out, so I didn't read any of the queer shit into this. Isn't that the best? Because like, no, like the first time I watched Star Trek TOS, I was like 18 and very closeted. And I was like, I just love their friendship. <laughs> like a dumbass. <laughs> and then like when I watched it older, I was like, this is a gay shit I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rewatching this was a completely different experience from how I remember it. Also, I feel like we really glossed over. You're like, well, I was doing Rocky Horror. I feel like you should talk about that oh, a little God. bit. How much time do you have? You don't have to talk about it a lot. But like for context, <laughs> like you say you're not really into horror and you're really more into like camp stuff. I'm like, that is what Rocky yeah. Horror is, right? That's exactly. It's gay, slutty camp shit, which is m- much more my brand. I started doing it. I lied about my age when I was 16 <laughs> because you had to be 17. So I lied about my age and I did it for about three years, three or four years there is nothing like a Rocky Horror convention at a medieval-themed hotel in Cincinnati <laughs> when you are 17 years old. I will never drink Jaeger again. But, yeah, it was very formative <laughs> and exposed me to a lot of the weird shit. Punk rock, the campy horror stuff, like BDSM, Dom shit, like all the things that I do now kind of can be traced back to that. I mean, it wasn't all good. There was definitely... Very bad parts. Yeah. But yeah, it was the catalyst for a lot of the things and interests I have now. Well, it makes sense that that's something that was really important and formative for you and so that you would gravitate towards horror stuff like Reanimator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so silly and fun. It is. Also, before we move on to like breaking it down and like my thoughts and notes, uh, how did you feel watching this movie as a new Star Trek fan, like a thing that, so Rosie got me into fanfic, but I bullied her ass into getting to Star Trek, and now she sits here wearing a Friend of Garrick (laughs) t-shirt, and this is Jeffrey Combs, right? Jeffrey Combs is Star Trek MV fucking P. I had no idea anything about Jeffrey Combs when I first watched this. I thought he was a babe, but that's about it. (laughs) And now I see Star Trek, and it's just a completely different, like, I'm... I love him. I'm obsessed with people with weird, unique careers in Hollywood. Like, I would die for Doug Jones. I'm very obsessed with Doug Jones. And Jeffrey Combs is similar. So watching this, knowing him as, like, stupid, sexy Shran and stuff. Stupid, sexy Shran. We are (laughs) Enterprise fans in this house. Yes. In this family, Star Trek Enterprise is a good show. Yeah. I would die for Flux. (laughs) Yeah. Any any person with half a brain would die for flies. Yeah, 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 yeah. But seeing it now, knowing his whole history is wild. Obviously, like, I didn't watch. So my relationship to this is I don't think I've ever really even heard of this movie, to be honest. Really? Like, I That's crazy to I me. know. It's so weird, the, like, horror blind stop spots that I have. The things that I have seen that I was like, I don't know, that wasn't that scary. And people are like, are you sure you watched The Exorcist when you were eight? Are you sure that wasn't scary? And I'm like, no, it didn't really mess me up. But you know what did? Deep blue sea. <laughs> we'll get there someday, I'm sure. Um, but I never really heard about this movie at all. And then obviously I'm a huge Star Trek fan, so like I know Jeffrey Combs. And when you picked this, I was like, oh hell yeah, I want to watch a Jeffrey Combs movie. And then 
I immediately glommed on to Herbert West and Dan Cain. You imprinted. I imprinted very hard. I was like, hmm, Herbert West is a psychopath and he is killing a lot of people, but he's also so small and I want to protect him. <laughs> I could have... Oh, man. I knew you would imprint on him. It's like, so small. He's baby. Must protect. He has He's a baby, blanket. baby. Must protect. He put a little blanket on him. <laughs> he loved his family. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Don't be sorry. <laughs> Leave it in. <laughs> Inside jokes stay on the podcast. <laughs> Oh, my God. That's so funny. Yeah. I mean, it is a fundamental tenet of my personality that I think blankets are the most romantic gift you can give somebody. (laughs) So that was like a very pivotal scene for me. (laughs) Noted. Noted. Don't give you don't give Stella a blanket unless hitting on. Yeah, unless hitting on. (laughs) Dan. Look out. So the way that this works is that I people come on, they pick out their horror property and I watched that one so like I watched Reanimator first and then I went back and I read Herbert West Reanimator which is was the first H.P. Lovecraft thing I've ever read oh man which we'll get into (laughs) Um, and then I did watch Bride of Reanimator and Beyond Reanimator but I'm just gonna say up top I don't want to talk about Beyond Reanimator it doesn't exist in my brain great I didn't even watch it yeah please never do (laughs) honestly please never do it's one of those it's like the supernatural finale I watched it once and now I've erased it from my brain and we'll never be talking about it again Beyond Reanimator blows don't watch it perfect you can't have a Reanimator movie without Dan Cain like you just can't it's weird and boring don't watch it full stop noted So before we jump in, I am going to do a quick movie synopsis via Shudder, because theirs are better than Wikipedia and Internet Movie Bad Database. Go figure. The classic 80s cult horror hit follows a student who brings the dead back to life. Herbert West, the brilliant Jeffrey Combs, has just enrolled at a new school after an attempt to revive a former professor went wrong. Convinced he's on the verge of a breakthrough, West sneaks into the morgue and revives a corpse, and that's where the terror and comedy begins. <laughs> Reanimator was the first and still the best of Stuart Gordon's gruesome and raunchy H.P. Lovecraft's adaptations. Thirty years later, it remains essential viewing for any true horror fan. Contains violence and gore. <laughs> sure does. And nudity. Lots sure. of nudity. So much nudity. I saw so many tits. I did not remember the number of tits I saw in this movie. So many tits. So many butts. A thing that I found in my research, uh, they I watched a bunch of like interviews and stuff, and there was an interview with the cinematographer, Mark Alberg, who is Swedish, and his whole thing is that they this came out unrated, right? Because they wanted mm. to show all the gore and blah, blah, sure. blah. But they had to walk this fine line of it becoming considered pornography, so they couldn't show it dicks and he kept being like stressed on set and people would be like Mac why do you look stressed and he'd be like he would say in his like Swedish accent like because I can see Vini's wagon everywhere (laughs) (laughs) and they're in this like extended interview clip it would like pan to like other people who worked on sets the sets and they all just did like a horrible Swedish accent being like Vini's everywhere (laughs) you can see that was so funny (laughs) you can see one like on a dead body as like Dan and Meg are like running to the elevator. You could see one, but it's like really quick. Oh, I did not catch that. I'll have to watch it again just for the Vinis. I'm always on the lookout. <laughs> always on the lookout for, <laughs> for Vinis. Vinis way. <laughs> <laughs> I loved this movie. Obviously, yeah. I know that I said that I like imprinted on Herbert West, which like obviously I did. He's just so small. He's baby must protect. <laughs> but this movie is really, really great. I am very grateful that I watched the thing before this because this movie is like very gory and the practical effects are very intense the gore factor is a lot i think they said that they use like they use 24 gallons of there blood it's what they use and the on previous like movies that nolan who had worked on he was like i had used like a max of like seven eight liters but i needed 24 gallons of blood for this fucking movie which is great like it is this is a comedy right but like part of the the comedy that comes from it is how deadpan like Jeffrey Combs is and Dan Kane amidst this like technicolor bloody horror happening in the background. So I am really glad that I watched the thing before because nothing will disturb me probably as much as that. <laughs> and I knew going into this from watching the trailer and stuff that it was like a zombie movie, mm-hmm. which historically I don't do great with zombies. I did okay with this though. I think maybe because because of the comedy maybe mm-hmm. or because I was like Herbert will survive. <laughs> so- I think you would have been much more scared. It was between this and Return of the Living Dead. 
And I think you would have been much more scared of the Return of the Living Dead zombies. Yeah, I'm not super looking forward to whoever picks that in the future. It's so good, though. <laughs> but I'm a baby. But maybe not. But some of this was, like, very hard to look at. Specifically in Bride, because it did the thing that I fucking hate that apparently is just, like, in everything that people make me watch, where things are fused together. Because at the end, there's the, like two people who are fused like back to back and then the two people who are like fused at the like hip very that x-files episode and it was horrible and i don't know why it shows up everywhere because it's so spooky in the in the book lovecraft calls it the tomb legions oh yeah which is a wild phrase and a great band name it is. There are like a lot of good like band names that you could pull from reanimator stuff. There's one that's a really good one, and I don't remember which article it's in, but I'll find it. Find it. Bloody cum shots. Bloody cum a shots. Great band name. Yeah, that would be <laughs> good band name. Yeah, I think that was the other one. Bloody cum shots. Also, I haven't taken this many notes or like done this level of reading since grad school. Yeah, but it's cheaper to come on my podcast. It is, <laughs> and it's going to get me just as far. I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> which is. You get a certificate Nowhere. at the end of being on this podcast. Perfect. I can't wait. I think the reason that this movie works for me, not only like the extremely queer reading, but it is so funny. Mm-hmm. It's so funny. Like when we were talking about it in the the Discord and stuff and I was talking about it with people, people kept bringing up the, the dead cat line. Like, what do you want me to leave a note? Dead cat details later. Cat dead details later, <laughs> yep. Which was great. And then the line where Herbert West says, they like get a job line. Yeah. Who's gonna believe you? You're a nothing more than a talking head. Get a job in a sideshow. And the way he delivers that is just like bam, 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 bam. But it's so he plays like the perfect straight man, right? Mm-hmm. What I think is really funny about that is in I watched some interview with him and he doesn't like his line reading of that really? that line, which is so incredible to me because it's like one of the most famous and people love it so much. Personally, my favorite line from the whole thing is when they're fighting the like first zombie that they bring back, the one that kind of looks mm-hmm. like Arnold Schwarzenegger because he literally was a body double for Arnold Schwarzenegger in a bunch of movies. <laughs> the one whose butt you see for the most time mm-hmm. uh, where the zombie is fighting the Dean and Dan is trying to get it off. And behind him, Herbert with his little like like chest saw is like, Dan, look out. <laughs> Dan, duck. <laughs> the amount of times you texted me about that line. Because he's so it's so soft and so like... Like, just a good sociopath line of, like, look out, and then just rams it into his chest, which the thing, not that these movies need to make sense, but, like, we're talking about them. It is, like, in your notes, too, you were like, why would you lobotomize a corpse? Like, what is the point of lobotomizing a zombie? Or, like, how do you kill, how do you kill this thing that you reanimated? Like, isn't it already, like, dead? Like, in The Bride, there's, like, a thing where they make a little finger eyeball monster and they just like squish it Mm -hmm. with a book and I was like but wouldn't it keep moving like how do you kill like you brought this thing back to life but it's already dead like nothing really works so putting a buzzsaw in in its chest like why would that kill it I think you just need to like separate it and like destroy the parts as much as that's why they use like the incinerator as a big thing in the book yeah that makes a lot of sense right like yeah just, just burn it burn the body yeah well that makes a lot of sense too because like part of the Love Lovecraft's whole thing is that he didn't really believe in the idea of a soul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff in the articles, too, about, like, the body as, like, a mechanical thing. Mm-hmm. And, like, West is super into – I don't know if he's specifically interested in disproving the existence of a soul, but more proving that, like, the body is a series of mechanical parts and you can restart it like you restart a car or something like that. Right. It's, it's called mechanistic materialism. So, like, the universe is a mechanism operating in accordance to fixed laws and therefore there can be no Im- immaterial substance such as the soul, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, Wes is, a, is, like, a pure – like, purely in it for, like, scientific – reasons right he's like no, no no this is like a this is a machine and so like it's broken all we have to do is fix the machine and even in he says in a couple of things like in bride when he like goes like full frankenstein and builds like a monster he's like oh it's just a collection of parts right like it's just a collection of parts there's no soul which i think is really really interesting especially like the comparison of frankenstein to this like the first movie and the book for for some of it, like they're not building a creature; they're just injecting the reanimate or mm-hmm. the reagent to like bring it back to life because it's like this is dead and now it's not because we're using this you know thing to bring the machine back to life. But then in Bride and then in later parts of the book, 
he does start to build things, the like little creepy, th- what did, what do we call them? The, the tomb legion. The tomb <laughs> legion. <laughs> and that becomes a more of like taking on godlike hubris. I'm a man. I can build something. I don't need a woman to create life. Oh, that's all. The whole other thing. <laughs> In the Weinstock article we read, the soul of the matter, Frankenstein meets H.P. Lovecraft's Herbert West reanimator. They talk about this. About, like, the narrator asks the revived corpse, like, where have you been? Like, wanting to know, like, what death was like. And it says, the revived corpse, having gone from person to clay and back again, cannot say where it has been because it has no awareness of ever having been gone. Death has merely hit the pause button. Yeah, I think that comes clear, too. In the the book and the in the movie Bride, which I keep bringing up Bride, even though Reanimator, the first one is a better movie but bride weirdly pulls from the book a lot more Mm -hmm. but herbert kills somebody right he Mm -hmm. like is like uh this person's alive but i would prefer them to be a corpse so i can do my experiments on them so he kills somebody in the book and he kills somebody in the movie and then he tells like dan or the unnamed narrator in the book like oh no like he attacked me or he had a heart attack on the stoop or whatever and then when he revives him the immediate response of the corpse is like get away from me you're killing me you're killing me and then dan slash unnamed narrator was like oh wait a minute you're a murderer now (laughs) yep yeah the i thought that the reactions in the original text were like always really interesting like it was always like what happened just before they died Mm -hmm. that was their reactions and like you see them trying to like get back to their graves yeah too especially i think with the first one that he brought back like because the grave was all clawed up after they had already like patted it down and made it good so like the it's implied that the dead things are trying to go back to being dead. Right. We're like, mm, this is actually, this is full like Buffy season like six or whatever where she was like, I was in heaven. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate you trying to bring Buffy into it. Yeah, I know I had to, right? No, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, the, it's not a novella because it was like, it was serialized. The was, serialized short story. Yeah, they call it a novella, but it was serialized. He sold chapters of it to, oh gosh, I forget the name of the publication. Well, he definitely thought he was slumming it. I did read that. He was like, Ugh. certainly was. He was just doing well, it for the money. Sometimes money. Yeah, it was very like, and it, that's why it reminded me of Dickensian stuff. Like, you know, paid by the word. Mm-hmm. Like, you really draw it out so you can get more money. Oh, well, and each chapter is like very repetitive for a while, too. It's like, let me remind you what happened in this in the chapter that I previously published. Right. I had to stop like just writing like, gay. He's gay. <laughs> They're describing him as a twink as, a twi- as oh like, yeah oh yeah it's serialized <laughs> in the in the book especially i think the casting of jeffrey combs just having like the people who made it reading the the source material and be like oh we're gonna transcribe it or whatever the casting of jeffrey combs is really really great because in the the novella or whatever they keep describing him as very like Faye and small and unassuming and like he could never be really evil because he's just this like little guy, <laughs> which I think the the casting of Jeffrey Combs is great because he especially compared to the actor that they get to play Dan Kane and and Hill and even Barbara, like he's smaller than all of them. And he's, you know, got his tie tucked into his shirt and he's wearing big nerdy glasses and is pretty soft spoken. But he's like this He's hiding this, like, very chaotic force inside of him, but because he comes off a certain way, people read him as non-threatening or read him as, like, oh, somebody that we can just write off, and that's their mistake. (laughs) Yeah, and it's it's why he can get as far as he had, because he's, like, a sweet little cutie. Yeah. And very charismatic, so he can kind of talk. He's, like, he can talk people into doing pretty much anything, and that's really evident in, like, the book. Where the narrator just seems like, oh man, I don't want to do this, but he's just so he's just so great and cool, and yeah. like, I just he's just, you know, I like him so much, but not in a gay way. <laughs> well, that, that's that, that's very interesting that you bring up because like the character of Dan Kane, uh, not Dean Kane of Superman fame. <laughs> <laughs> um, come on, the whole honestly, I was watching Reanimator for the first time, and I was like, no, they're not saying Dean Kane. <laughs> no, okay, no, it's Dan Kane. <laughs> He, in the book and the movie, he acts like he's such a victim and he acts like he's not actively making choices and participating. And that is so, it's so interesting to me because if you like are watching the movie, you're like, oh, well, you know, Herbert West is the the anti-hero, like 
he's the antagonist that we like love to hate, but we love to love him because he's small. And we must protect. But like Dan Kane acts like he's you know just being pulled into into Herbert West's like orbit, and he, there's nothing he can do to escape. But like he actively makes a choice to be there, consistently in in both Reanimator. Herbert West reanimator and like Bride of Reanimator, like there's no reason for him to follow Herbert West to Peru <laughs> right. into a war zone. There's literally no reason to do it except for he's like, I don't know, I just wanna and he does it under this guise of like, I care about people so much. Like I I really, really want to save them. And like that's like the way he convinces himself. And we get that in the beginning of Reanimator, where the first shot we see of Dan Kane is he's like trying to bring somebody back to life. And the the lady doctor is like you got to relax. She's like fucking dead. Okay? Like, let it fucking go. Like, part of being a doctor is not doing whatever the fuck you're doing right here. Yeah. And that's like a continued thing. Like, it's always been – like, he keeps losing people. He He's not a good doctor in that he cares too much and he, like, right. can't handle losing people, which makes him the perfect accomplice for Herbert West, yeah. who is trying to bring back people all the time. Their relationship also reminds me a lot of those like Victorian romantic friendships. Oh yeah, you know, and and especially the friendships. They were roommates. Yeah, the friendships <laughs> that I had when I was like a preteen with my girlfriends, and I was like, yeah, we're just like really good friends, and she should just hang out with me all the time. Like, why would she ever want to hang out with a boy? Like, what could a boy do that I can't? It's pretty silly. Uh, she should dump him and just hang out with me all the time. <laughs> well, I mean, Herbert West too is like. I love that I just say his whole name. Uh, you have to. <laughs> you can't be like Herbert. I call him Westy, I think, in my notes. Yeah, you do call him Westy because you just wrote a bunch of times, Westy hates women, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, yeah. he's presented, like, he meets Barbara and is just, like, immediately like, no. <laughs> Barbara? Right? Isn't that her name? Meg? The name of the actress is Barbara. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> LOL, whatever. Yeah. Meg. I think because I wrote a bunch of stuff about her and I just kept saying Barbara. <laughs> Meg. Right, it's Meg's heart. Yes, it's Meg's heart. It's Meg's heart and Barbara's acting. <laughs> <laughs> but he meets Meg and they immediately have this like contention where she's like, he's weird. How come nobody else can see how fucking weird he is? And Dan is like, I don't know, that money looks pretty good to me. <laughs> and then Herbert is like, no, I don't like this woman. No. What is he? He has like even a line where he's like, do I make him uncomfortable? And she says, yes. And he just goes, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> up turn nose full up turn nose like hmm Herbert West is definitely somebody who is like no women in my gay bar <laughs> yeah hundred percent yeah I don't think he has one positive interaction with there aren't many women characters in general there's Meg and there's the doctor mm-hmm. um, who is the director's wife really? fun facts fun facts from Stella Jinx love a fun <laughs> fact yeah there aren't really many and I don't know if Herbert ever interacts with her actually but the only woman that he interacts with, he actively dislikes. Right. Well, I think that sets up the the like dynamic of this like weird love triangle, which is important into how you like read this queer reading, right? Because like Dan is trapped in the middle and he's trying to have this like very normal life. He's like, where I'm going to get my doctor. I'm going to get my doctor degree. <laughs> what I'm doctor? I'm getting my doctor degree. <laughs> and then I'm going to marry. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. He's getting his doctor degree. That's what it is. I thought I was the one who was loopy for not having eaten today. Here, look, I've had like four cups of coffee, some Adderall. I read <laughs> several academic articles. I made a very funny video for the internet that nobody's laughing at. I've had a wild morning. <laughs> Dan, <laughs> Dr. Degree, just pick up there. Um, he's got a plan to marry Meg slash Barbara. Megbra? <laughs> Megbra. He's got a, a plan to marry Megbra, which I love in your notes. You were like, good for you, girl. Wait until he gets that doctor to get to lock it down. Yeah. You got to wait, man. <laughs> she's, she's pretty smart in this film. Like, she could. I think that's part of the reason I wrote Barbara a bunch of my notes, because I think this actress does a really good job. Like, this could be a... Fla- flailing like whiny character and you know she screams and is flailing when appropriate because the things that are happening around her are horrific but she is like weirdly grounded and and at one point Herbert calls her like a bubble-headed co-ed and like yes she's not Dan's the bubble-headed co-ed in this Very. Dan's the, <laughs> the bimbo in this I think she's smart but not capable is the thing like she's smart intellectually but like there's a moment where like I call him John Kerry because he looks like 2008 presidential candidate Hill. John Kerry. Yeah, I call Hill John Kerry and everything. 
So <laughs> John Kerry like has her strapped to the thing and one of her arms gets free and she just sits there screaming. I'm like, bitch, you have a whole arm free. Get out of there. Yeah, I get what you're saying there. But like also imagine being her and having this like totally normal life and then this like Lil Twink comes in and ruins <laughs> and like kills your cat and seduces your boyfriend, murders your dad, turns him into like a weird zombie. You have to deal with this Carl Hill dude who you're like totally used to like being really creepy to you, but you have to be like respective. Like you have to like play that game of like, but he's my da- dad's coworker and I can't just tell him to like eat shit and die. And then you walk in and you see all these fucking crazy zombies. And then this dude who's been creeping on you for a long time just does it have a head anymore but oh his head is right there in his hands and like I feel like you would be paralyzed with fear at that point I mean as a Scorpio I have to say that I would have reacted much differently (laughs) but no we can definitely get into that particular scene later because it's the scariest oh for sure oh for sure it is it it is definitely the most horrifying part of the movie but what I was saying about our resident bimbo Dan King (laughs) I'm not even calling him a himbo he's just the resident bimbo I love this head cannon. (laughs) He is trying to get this, like, normal life, whatever, and then he's seduced, whether you think it is, like, sexually or just, like, sexy science um, by Herbert West. And he he is coming up against, like, do I want this very, like, heteronormative, like, life or am I doing this, like, transgressive queer life both as for my career and is my relationship? And there was a quote from Harry uh, Benshoff's Monsters in the Closet, Homosexuality and the Horror Film. That I thought like encapsulated this perfectly says the monstrously queer deviation of the gothic villain is also clearly marked within the text by the presence of an assertively normal heterosexualized couple who serve as the center of a naturalized and normative heterosexual equilibrium, which the queer force disrupts. One or both members of this, quote, normal couple become involved in the villain's plot. The queer villain's desire for one or both members of the couple is one of the main thematic imperatives of the genre. However, by the end of the film, the villain slash and or monster is destroyed by a public mob or its patriarchal representatives and the, quote, normal couple are reinstated after safely passing through their queer experience. Yeah, I highlighted that too. Yeah, it's great. But also part of the great thing about that, if you take that quote and apply it to the reanimator series, especially this first movie, they don't become a normal couple at the Mm -hmm. end, right? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess we could say Herbert is taken down by like the intestine monster and like pulled away and we like, quote, don't know what happens to him. We presume he's dead until he shows up alive and bride. But at the end of Reanimator, it subverts us because like West is presumed dead and Meg is, quote, brought back by Dan. But like in we don't see what happens. We just hear this horrific scream. So even if she survived, they are not a normal couple anymore. Right. Right. Like it's still a transgressive couple. And Herbert has successfully, whether or not he's alive or dead, has successfully destroyed their, like, heteronormativity, which I think is great. It's all he ever wanted. (laughs) He's like, I may be dead, but I went out swinging. (laughs) Which I think is part of the reason, like, not only does this movie read extremely queer because of the, like, fayness of the Herbert West character, but because, like, it is transgressive through the whole thing up until it ends. Like, there is no, like, reverting. Because that's, like, a thing in a lot of horror movies that, like, they revert back to the normal at the end. We've killed the monster. We've mm-hmm. saved the day. Like, yes, we're all changed. But, like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get past this someday. We'll find a normal someday. And it's like, no, in this movie specifically, like, this equilibrium is rocked forever. It's like the it's the whole barrier gaze thing with like queer horror, especially. And I'm interested if you I want you to watch Sleepaway Camp because it's a really great example of barrier gaze and queer horror where the queer character has to be vanquished or killed or somehow brought down in order for like everything to be okay again. And that doesn't that happen. Like you said, it happens, but it doesn't in this. And like in Bride, like it didn't happen. He's still there. Yeah. Which I think. I said I wouldn't bring up Beyond, but, like, I'll touch on it really (laughs) quick. I think that's part of the – looking at the series as, like, a whole – not the book, obviously, because he does actually die in the end of the book. His head is ripped from his body and he is – But does he (laughs) do But in the movie specifically, like, both Reanimator and Bride end in, like, a vague-ish way of, like, is Herbert alive? Is he dead? But then, you know, he's not by the time we get to Beyond. And in Beyond specifically – one of the final scenes is Herbert, like, walking out of prison, picking up his doctor bag, looking around, <laughs> covered in blood, and just, like, fucking walking <laughs> off into the night, which, like, 
part of me doesn't like because I kind of like the messy ending, but part of me is like, I love that this dude fucking keeps living. And I love that this dude that everybody like writes off as like not being a threat is just like, I am the most threatening person or thing you have ever encountered. Like the fact that Carl Hill walks into his fucking like basement and it's like, hey, I'm here to steal your shit. So, hey. And then like he just gets immediately he murdered. Kills him. The thing is he he survives even without his physical body because at the end of one, he like yells his note, my notes, my notes. And he like throws his notes to Dan so Dan can take his notes and presumably like continue on with his shit. So he's determined to survive even if he's not like physically surviving, survive through his work and stuff. That is such a good point that I had never even thought about. Like if we never got Bride or Beyond and it's just the end of the of the first movie, he is still surviving and still destroying Dan's life because he's like, you got my notes. And there's, and you know, like that's the, the hubris and the downfall of like scientists, right? It's like, I know that this research is bad, <laughs> but also want to keep fucking around with it. So even if like, you know, Meg was, right, Meg? Barbara? Yeah, Meg. <laughs> Meg was still Megra. around. Megra um, <laughs> was still around and not presumably a monster. Like that, the like overwhelming presence of Herbert West would still be there because like the journal is there. Right. Speaking of the audacity of science, we mentioned it a little bit, but I think that the idea of, I mean, the idea in like a book like Frankenstein, which obviously has a lot of parallels, or Reanimator is this idea of creating life without a female presence. Right. Which Mm -hmm. Herbert obviously wanted to do this by himself. But now with Dan as his, quote, assistant, uh, it's like the idea of these two men looking to create life without female intervention is very queer. Oh, yeah. Like there's no womb to be seen. And in Frankenstein, a lot of the articles we read talked about in Frankenstein, like the act of creation being like a masturbatory thing, like. It was just Frankenstein. He didn't have, like, the Dan equivalent. Right. But this, the sentence that I really love is from that amazing article that you found that I think is just an internet scholar. Yeah, the internet Dr. scholar, Worm. Dr. Worm, <laughs> who I I trolled, scrolled through the internet. I was like, I got to find this person on, like, Tumblr or, like, because this is, like, an old live journal. Yeah. It's incredible. Like, God bless internet scholars because, honestly, the stuff that they write is so much, A, more accessible, but also is just, like, brilliantly well-researched, like, way more than a lot of, like, peer-reviewed bullshit. But I tried to find this person, and I could find their old, like, live journal, and I found some fic that they wrote. Oh, man, I want to read it. But... They haven't written fic under that pseudonym for, like, years. I couldn't find a Twitter or whatever. So if anybody – if if you are Dr. Worm and Dr. you're Worm. out there, so we are Dr. Worm fan girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the internet scholar thing because with the problem with academia and, like, one of my problems with one of the articles that we tried to read that I couldn't get through is they just, like, take pages and pages and pages to say something that could have been, like, a few sentences just because they have to, like, grandiose academize. Bullshit. Bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> they have to bullshit it. And when you're just writing for yourself and for the internet. And for your cool friends. And for your peers, you don't have to do that. And you can actually talk about the thing that you're talking about. So in Dr. Worm's brilliant article. Together um, we are Providence. Yeah, it's so good. It's definitely the best article that we read. By they, and far. Absolutely. They wrote, two men working together towards such a goal, the goal being the creation of the bride, is not a mad scientist circle jerk which is a great band name, <laughs> um, but a homoerotic partnership in which the goal of producing offspring becomes all important. It's womb envy. Womb envy. Very that. But also like, a good band name. <laughs> very. I wouldn't even say envy, though, because they're doing it. Like, they're doing it together. It's like they're creating life together. Dr. Worm also talks about hypodermic needles being, like, really phallic. Oh, yeah. Um, which, for sure. And the fact that, like, there's scenes of like Dan taking the needle from Herbert and injecting and like Herbert like taking Dan's hands and it, there's a lot of especially in needle Bride shit. especially in Bride when they're building a creature together mm-hmm. that's where the the bloody cum shot comes from right <laughs> cuz you know the one of the veins that they're building like 
spurts out and then they have to like cover that up and in that article too they call them bloody cum shots and we've said that maybe 15,000 so times today because times. we keep laughing because we're six years old yeah but thinking of that hypodermic needle there's that cut scene that I sent you there's a scene cut from the original reanimator where Herbert makes Dan a sandwich <laughs> Which is very cute. But then Herbert goes to his room and there's like a cla- or crash or something and Dan follows him in and he finds that Herbert is re- is injecting himself with a watered down version of the reagent to keep him awake because like as a good scientist, he's like, why would I sleep when I could be doing science? <laughs> yeah, he's doing speed basically. And I, I highlighted and like drew little hearts around this <laughs> text in that article in which they say he implores Dan to help him with a shaky cry of, I need it, please. <laughs> a statement that is easily sexualized out of context, while also being recognizable as innuendo within context. Moreover, after the injection is successfully completed, Herbert jerks to his feet, throws back his head, stiffens, shudders, and then relaxes as he smiles beatifically at Dan, apparently satisfied. Yeah, that scene is wild. Yeah. I think that, I don't know... It- if I would want it in the film, I like that I've seen it and that we know it because that is like it is a very like queer scene and like the s- subtext, not subtext of like the the needle and then like I need it type yeah. stuff. But also the idea of Herbert being on drugs the whole time does kind of change the like the dynamic of why he's doing it and how he's doing it. What do you think about that cutscene? It absolutely makes it a completely different movie. Yeah. And I think that if it was in it, we would be having a similar but not exactly the same conversation. And I think the fact that Dan helps him with it instead of just like dismissing it and being like, you're an addict, whatever, (laughs) definitely all, you know, phallic shit aside, definitely makes it way more queer. Like he's so like gentle. They're always very gentle with each other. Yeah. I mean, the scene, I keep bringing it up as a joke, but like the scene where... The shit hits the fan and they like reanimate a zombie or reanimate a person for the first time and the dean dies and and Meg sees it and runs out and they're covered in blood. Dan literally lays down on the ground and goes into like complete shock and Herbert covers him with a blanket and talks to him very softly and is like, it's going to be okay. We're going to figure it out. This is just a hiccup in our little experiment. Experiments don't always go to plan. We'll figure it out together. And I think... A big thing about this whole movie, why it's so easy to read a relationship between them, is the way that Herbert's tone changes when he talks to Dan specifically. Like, Herbert is a dick to everybody else in the movie. Especially Meg and his, like, tone between Dan and Meg. Because he's also often talking to them, like, one right after each other. Yeah. It's, like, so noticeable, like, how he just, like, spits vitriol at her and then, like, is, like, oh, my... It's okay, Dan. It's my sweet babe. (laughs) Yeah, he has a very soft voice with him. And it like it is you could read that as very manipulative. Like it is. Oh, it totally is. Like he is a manipulative little shit. But also I think that it's not just manipulation. He does like Dan and Mm -hmm. he cares about Dan and he he wants Dan, whether you read it in a sexual way or you read it as like, I want this person to be my partner. I want to be doing this with somebody. He shows no interest in any other living person in, like, any of the movies. He only shows interest in Dan. Everyone else is kind of just like, oh, maybe I will reanimate you when you're dead. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe I would think about reanimating you. I'm looking at you, and right now you look like you'd make a really excellent corpse. Yeah, they they talk (laughs) about that, like, specifically in the book, too. Like, yeah, the narrator just noticed Wes, like starting to look at people like you know like they're his dinner or whatever like oh you're you're a future uh, corpse you're a future corpse <laughs> yeah. i got my eye on you for when you pass away <laughs> <laughs> getting back to come uh, <laughs> as, uh, <laughs> getting us yes i would love to get back to the circling cum. back to come circling back to per <laughs> my last come shot <laughs> um the the best article in the world, they talk about all, like, the spurting blood as, like, abrupt ejaculation, too. Like, Dan, at one point, like, Dan clamps, like, an artery. Like, I think Herbert, like, severs an artery. And right, Dan that's in Bride it. specifically. Yeah, that's in they're, Bride. like, weaving the body together. And yes. they're like, we got to put veins in this thing. And then it, like, spurts blood, which looks like a, like, cum shot. 
And then the author talks about how it's reinforced because when Francesca, the new Meg, comes The Italian to, Meg. The Italian Meg, who's <laughs> I like a lot better than Meg, who comes to the door. Dan is, like, trying to guiltily hide the bloodstains on his shoes, which is very, like, hiding, you know, you came in your pants and now you have yeah. to hide it and like or, like, put a towel over yourself. So it's very, like, teenage cum shot shit. Herbert's reaction to Francesca, too, is very interesting because in the beginning, he hates Meg immediately, right? And then we meet Francesca, like, on the battlefield mm-hmm. in Peru. Francesca fucks. Yeah, Francesca is very capable. She literally is in a war zone with him. But then we see them leave Peru with their lizard and they <laughs> come back and they're working as, as doctors again. And Francesca shows up and is like, hey, Dan, remember me from the war we were in? Mm -hmm. That we didn't really explain at all. And she's like, I think maybe we could get dinner sometime. And Herbert and Dan are working together and living together in a real like, oh, my God, they were roommates moment. Like, (laughs) theoretically, at this point, other than them having like a secret dungeon laboratory next to a cemetery, there is no reason for them to be living together, right? Like, they're both doctors. They presumably make... Dr. Bucks. Right. (laughs) And like, (laughs) Herbert could have gotten his own place, I feel like, in the first movie. He waved that whole wad of cash under Dan's nose. And if he has all this money through, like, I have no idea how he got that money. He Um, just... Probably from the scientist he murdered from the in the beginning. I, I get. I mean, I sh- gave him life wild and, and took his money. <laughs> I get. That's where all the banks are. Um, <laughs> yeah. So he like could have feasibly gotten his own place. So there had to be a reason because he met Dan before, right? Because they became the, roommates. Because the, the dean is like, "Hi, this is our new student, Herbert West. This is Dr. Carl Hill. This is Dan Kane." And immediately <laughs> Herbert is like, "Oh, I'm familiar with your work. It is." bullshit (laughs) filthy plagiarist and then he like him and dan don't have like a totally friendly interaction but he's checking him out he's checking him out they're both checking each other out and dan is like entertained by herbert like dressing down this dude right so they do meet and then herbert just shows up and is like i found this ad in the paper like but he he's not surprised when dan opens the door and it's like oh it's you that person that i met Mm -hmm. earlier he's like totally like i'm here with a wad of cash let me into your basement oh yeah he absolutely knew in the age before google like herbert knows everything about dan i'm sorry (laughs) in the age before google i can picture him knowing absolutely everything about dan before he rang that doorbell oh for sure but so like they're they're roommates in the second one right and even in like a video commentary jeffrey combs is like noted by saying like Why are they roommates? Like, there's no reason for them to be roommates unless dot, 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 right? They're living together. And so when Francesca shows up, because, like, they've presumably, like, they've gotten rid of Meg. We know that she died. Her heart exists, like, outside of her body. Like, we hear her her horrific, like, reanimated scream at the end of the movie, but she dies, right? She's not there in the beginning. She's certainly not in Peru. And then... They go back and they're living together and they have their fun, like, laboratory dungeon. And then Francesca shows up Mm -hmm. and throws a wrench into it again. Mm -hmm. And that's the impetus for Herbert to be like, you don't need her. I will build you a bride. Every time (laughs) Herbert is faced with heterosexual sex, he reacts with disgust. Like, with Meg. Because, like, they had just finished fucking when, like, he opens the door to Herbert being like, hey, I want to be your roommate. And Herbert's clearly disgusted at it. Herbert creeps out when Dan and uh, Francesca are fucking. Herbert is kind of like... Also eavesdrops on them. Eavesdrops, clearly disgusted and bothered by it. And like, gel- I like jealousy is there. Right. Oh, I mean, he literally uses the like... Because when her or where Dan, when Dan and Francesca are having sex, Dan's like rubbing up on her titties and is like so warm, mm-hmm. so warm, so alive, so warm. And then when Herbert is trying to entice Dan to stay with him, essentially work with him, he literally takes Meg's heart in his hand as like a, a proposal, an offering. It's like I have Meg's heart, like. Where does the soul live or whatever? Like, Herbert, I think we can safely assume, doesn't believe in a soul. He really subscribes to the, like, mechanism ideal. But Dan is this, like, bimbo romantic. He definitely, like, thinks about a soul. So he's like, I have your ex-girlfriend's heart. That's potentially where the soul lives, right? I will build you a woman that not only has Meg's heart, but it has this head of this patient you imprinted on. Also, these whore's legs. (laughs) I know, I didn't even catch that. How do you not? That's my favorite scene Uh, in in Bride. Well, there's actually quite a lot 
Bride is like a fucking mess, but there are so many good scenes that like if it bring it together. Hour long, it would have been excellent, but yeah. it was too long. I I enjoyed Bride, but I love in his like pitch, like he's like a car salesman in that <laughs> thing. He's like, I got Meg's heart, I got these ballerina feet, I got these whore legs, I got Georgia's head. Like I just built you the perfect woman, and. Dan has a live smoking hot Italian upstairs, and he's like, I don't know. I'm into these whore legs. I he gets sway he gets swayed by by Herbert's pitch. And he uses that language. Herbert uses that language. He's like, he like mocks him and is like so cold in death, but so warm in life. Like he he parrots that pillow talk. So he was literally eavesdropping on their sex. Yeah, and he offers, I don't know, he just offers Dan something more interesting. Like, right. he has Francesca upstairs, and she's, like, you know, warm and soft and predictable. Right. Even though, you know, she's a badass in a war zone, that's a lot less interesting than this little twink in the basement putting together <laughs> a lady for you. Well, Meg and Francesca offer a normal life, and Herbert offers an extraordinary life. Right? Yeah. I, oh, I forget what article that's from. But yeah, exactly that. Like the queer character and all of this stuff, all of like any queer coded villain or queer coded character in like horror movies offers something different than like the heterosexual norm. And like that's going to take a lot of work. It's going to be more interesting life for you, but it's going to take a lot of work. And a lot of times the characters don't put in but, like, it's just unfeasible for them to put in the work. Right. And Dan tries to put in the work, and we see kind of work. <laughs> yeah, Dan Dan commits in a way, right? Mm-hmm. Like, even in Reanimator, when Meg is still alive, Meg is like, what are you doing here, man? Like, Yeah, you have a whole, like, your life is all planned out. Everything is set. This is exactly how your life is going to be. Why are you straying from that path? But also, like, you are seeing what working with Herbert does. You see my father foaming at the mouth, Mm -hmm. you know, running into walls. You you're seeing a headless corpse. You're seeing all this happen. How are you still choosing that? And Dan, like, there's even a kind of a scene where she's trying to lay it all out. Like, what are you doing? We have to, you know, fight back, whatever. And he is responding to her, but it's also kind of like floaty. Like, "Mm, I feel like I should be getting back to Herbert. (laughs) Right. And I think it's interesting because Meg is a character that is not in the book. Like, there's no female... There's only one female in the book, and it's, like, the mother Mm -hmm. of a missing boy. And she's presented as this, like, hysterical woman Mm -hmm. who can't find her son, and she's completely written off by all of the characters in the book. And then turns out, shocker, she was right, and her son was taken and cannibalized. Right. Specifically, because it is Lovecraft, specifically a hysterical Italian woman, because Lovecraft is super racist, and, you know, the working class are hysterical and... Women are also. But we'll get into that in a little bit. <laughs> sure, sure. But yeah, the, Meg, is, Meg is a new character in the movie. And I think, weirdly, the addition of a prominent female character makes us even gayer. Yeah, because it's it, obvious. It yeah. goes back to that thing that we were talking about earlier, that the the you are presented with this heteronormative life, and then the queer villain or queerness comes in and disrupts that, right? Mm-hmm. But Herbert is an interesting character because he is clearly villainous right and we joked earlier we're like must protect small whatever he's clearly (laughs) villainous but he's not the villain of these movies right like he is the driving force of the queerness of it but he is not the villain of this movie like dr carl hill is the capital v villain Mm -hmm. of these movies right like so even though the traditional view of we glom onto these queer characters and this queer readings in horror but they usually are the bad guys herbert walks that really fine line that anti-hero thing of he is doing bad things he's literally like robbing graves and killing people and doesn't has no compunctions about his the consequences of his actions but he's also not the baddie (laughs) right and he like toes that line really well and that he's not you don't he's not actively murdering the only person i think he actively murders is hill and like we all cheer at that yeah we all cheer at that i wish we could kill him again and again and again and again well you kind of (laughs) get it turns out you kind of get in the book, it is different because Wes does start killing people. And we talked about he starts, you know, viewing people like, hmm, you are a future corpse. You're a future corpse. And then in Bride, he does also do that. He murders that cop who, like, 
you know, a cab, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> also, he was so they make it like really prominent and bride like the cop was a wife beater. Oh yeah, like that dude deserved to die. He'll deserve to die. Yeah. So there's also the added element of like, yeah, Herbert West is a killer, but he also is taking people who suck. Yeah. Which is a really interesting like way to view a villainous character. Mm-hmm. I do want to move on to Dr. Carl Hill, but I think just finishing this thought of the idea of these two male protagonists creating life without, like, a female presence, obviously we've talked about, like, why that is inherently queer, but I think it's interesting to go from the reanimator movie where they're bringing back people who are full bodies, Mm -hmm. right? And then to go full Frankenstein in Bride and start to build bodies, because those are different those are the intentions behind that are so different. Oh yeah, and like there's this again in like the best article they talk Shout about out that. Doctor Worm, <laughs> Doctor Worm, <laughs> love you. <laughs> <laughs> they talk about like it is interesting to note that a great many of Herbert's morbid doodlings, another good band name. That um, is when we were saying band names. I was like, there's one that I wrote doodlings. down. Morbid doodlings is the best <laughs> band name. Um, morbid doodlings, as seen in Pride. <laughs> Reflect a tremendous amount of intersexual turmoil and frustration with the heterosexual model of love and romance. Frequently, his creations, which he pushes out of sight in the crypt next door, are grotesquely forced conglomerates of male and female body parts. Yeah. So you see, like, a... I, I didn't even know that the, the, the things had names, because oh, they talk about the names. Horrific. There's one called Two-Face, which That's is... the one that really gets me. That's the one that I was talking about that does the fusing. Yeah. Where it's, the, it's literally, like... You took two people, split them in half, and smushed them together, and that's, like, the thing that I hate the most. But, yeah, it's it's very notable that it's a man and a woman smushed together. Yeah, and you have another one where it's, like, a man's torso and a woman's torso connected at, like, the stomach. You have one that's a little – it says a little less obvious. Like, there's a character with, like, a man with a breast grafted onto his shoulder. Like, a lot of weird, like, mushing together and – of gender and sex. Of gender. And, and it says in the article, it says that it could represent like his disgust with the sexual coming together of men and women and the role of reproduction. I think it definitely can be read as that. I also think it's being, for me, it reads as a temper tantrum. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it reads com- completely as a temper tantrum to me. Yeah. Because the thing about Herbert West, too, is I think that he has a queer relationship with Dan, but I also do think that. Herbert reads to me as very asexual, mm-hmm. right? Like he he doesn't have any of the traditional trappings of like showing off masculinity or femininity in either way. He's very like baseline. He doesn't seem interested in striking up a sexual relationship with Dan. It's more of like a this he wants to entrench his life with him. Yeah. He's disgusted by all the women. He is really disgusted by the idea of the sex with women specifically. And I think that reading him as an asexual representation makes just a lot of sense. Oh, it does. And it's like very Victorian again. And like it's I could see it as an aromantic attraction for oh, sure. Totally. Like Dan he wants Dan to be his partner and they don't say that it's sexual or not, but either way, Dan is his partner and that's what he wants. Well, I think that also helps reinforce the idea of like why Herbert builds the bride, Mm -hmm. right? Not only is he have experience building horrific things because he's having his little temper tantrums, but he is, he's like, Dan, I, you don't need Francesca. You don't need Meg. I will build you the perfect bride. But that to me is the way that Herbert is like, I know that I can't give you this part of the relationship and I don't want to give you this part of this relationship. Right. Right. But I need to be in control of this part of the relationship, and I need you to not leave me, so I will gift you a thing that I created or we created together so that it's still a part of our relationship. Like, even when they bring her to life, they're they're interconnected. Like, Dan is injecting the reanimate into, into the bride, and Herbert is, like, behind him, like, touching him, mm-hmm. like, on the shoulder. It is, like, they are connected, bringing this thing to life. It is intrinsically theirs. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. And I will counter that with, he built his boyfriend a fuck doll. Oh, yeah. He built his boyfriend a fuck doll. Yeah. And... and he even says at some point, 
paraphrasing, but he's he says to Francesca, like, you can never live up to our girl. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> he not. Literally it's, says that. it's when they're fighting. It's when the, um, Francesca and the bride are fighting, and he says it to Dan. He said, your girl doesn't stand a chance against our girl. Yeah, that is so... So like remarkable that that send and if you're not paying attention, it can just kind of wash over you because there's so much happening with a fight. But like that sentence, but then two minutes later, when the girl, the bride, is like pushing back against Herbert, he's like, "You're just a bunch of parts. Get out of my face!" Right. <laughs> so and she's the, also easily dismissible to him. She's disgusted by Herbert too, which is another thing. Like she's like immediately glomps onto Dan and is really disgusted by Herbert. And Herbert takes like a paternal role kind of towards her immediately. Like yeah. the fact that she could be sexual for him is never even any sort of it yeah. doesn't enter his brain. Yeah, absolutely. And she, it's yeah, because she gloms on to Dan and it's like, you created me. And Herbert's like, I created you. <laughs> Never forget. <laughs> Call your mother. <laughs> so now that we've talked about this beautiful relationship. Uh, <laughs> let's take a hard turn because we've put it off long enough and talk oh. about the horrific Dr. Carl Hill. I wish oh. I had a, I wish I wasn't using a pen. I wish I had a pencil. So you could should break have, it. Should have bought pencils for this. This is a prop podcast like last time we had jb's we should have got pencils just crack <laughs> i find it's uh very nice for an audio medium to have a visual element well that a cracking pencil would have yeah, okay. you know <laughs> put a cracking pencil noise in here bobby dr carl hill god what a fucking creep i just i just can't great villain oh great villain you hate him so much yeah you hate him so it makes so much. you want to protect yeah you want <laughs> to protect and you want to resurrect him so you can kill him again before we get into it, I have a question. Mm. Because it, Carl Hill is based off of a character in the book that has a different name. Because mm-hmm. there's a character in the book when they're in the Great War, not the Peruvian War. They, <laughs> they are doing experience or whatever. And a, a medical pilot or something like goes mm. down and is decapitated. And Herbert's like, this seems like a thing that I can play with. And he injects the reanimate into the head. and the Or he rejects it into the body. But yes. the head reanimates too. Because you can hear it being like, oh, jump, jump or whatever. And then it comes back to haunt him in the end of the the story mm-hmm. by putting on the like plastic head, which we do see in in the Reanimator movie. And he is also like the alpha zombie and is leading all the other zombies around. And that happens in Reanimator movie too. I literally gotta wrote bring that. alpha shit into really it, did. don't you? I literally wrote it in my notes. I was like, is this an alpha zombie? <laughs> <laughs> you will not rest until I read ABO. <laughs> First of all, I was thinking of it more in the supernatural way where there's like an alpha like vampire that is the head or whatever of controlling and it's not actually sexual and supernatural. It gets freaky in the Something's thick. not sexual and supernatural. I'm I'm just saying. I'm just I'm thinking of it as like the leader, right? Yeah. But what is it about Carl Hill that allows him to retain his personality, retain his brain, retain whatever? Cuz like arguably the dean is the fresher corpse and also has his head attached. So why does he reanimate crazy or dead or whatever? And and why does Dr. Carl Hill, the decapitated body, reanimate with, like, a brain? Yeah, I wonder if it has something to do with an understanding of what's happening. Maybe. Like, because Hill, like, knew what was going to happen, what was happening to him as soon as, presumably, like, at his last moment. And... Yeah, I didn't even connect Hill to the character in the original story. How could you not? He's headless. I should. And he's walking around. I had to keep reminding myself that the original story was in the 20s. 1922, baby. 1922, because I kept being like, (laughs) they're talking about gas lamps is crazy. I mean, that's what most Victorian like literature or like gothic stuff is. It's like, was that a ghost? Was that a ghost? Oh, no, we were just dying of gas poisoning. (laughs) It was just my (laughs) sexual repression. It was uh, my sexual repression and all of the gas I'm accidentally huffing because there are gas lights up there and I'm hallucinating all the time. <laughs> better, better times, man. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, actually. I didn't think about that. But Dr. Hill is walking into the laboratory dungeon, knows about the, the medicine that Herbert has created, mm-hmm. is walking in there with the intention to steal it, yes. has a conversation with Wes, and presumably if he's getting his head chopped off by Wes while looking him in the eyes, he probably has a thought that's like, well... This bitch is definitely going to reanimate me because that's his whole thing. And we talked about previously, like, there have been instances in the book and in Bride where when a person is reanimated, they are reliving their last moment. So that makes actually a ton of sense that he's reliving his last moment Mm -hmm. and maybe it's enough to spark 
thought or whatever. That makes a lot of sense. I accept that as a theory. Yeah. And it's it's read a lot more. It's read as camp in the movie and it's read as horror in the book because it's corpses trying to re like go back to their graves and relive their last moments. But in the movie, like it kind of it's not just them screaming for their lives. It's Hill like being like, oh, okay, I'm going to continue to try to steal your work. Right. Well, and also in the book, too, once Hill, the character that is essentially Hill, I can't remember his name. He's some pilot or whatever. He also leads like a zombie army. And so I think that also plays into that idea of the less fresh corpses being reanimated and being like the last thing I remember is like being in the ground or whatever, being easily swayed by like, well, this person is dead like me. But also they seem like. Yeah. What would you say? Great show. Dead like me. Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) That's a Brian Fuller jam, right? Of course it is. We definitely love de- Brian Fuller. Death of the author, except for Brian Fuller, <laughs> is the motto in this house. Brian Fuller can live forever. <laughs> so we see him like leading the, the zombie army. I think that makes sense, actually. We've connected all the dots. We're geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Carl Hill, villain extraordinaire. Not only is he a person who underestimates Herbert West's power, essentially, mm-hmm. and willingness to turn him into a corpse, he gets brought back, knocks out West, doesn't kill him and i i could see him not wanting to kill him because he wants to steal as much of his work as possible and you can't and gloat he's a yeah. gloater oh yeah he this will little tell twink you interrupted his like his lecture that he practices mm-hmm. and has a lot of jokes that always nail and like it's the same lecture he gives every year he's and the he's type like, of villain that will tell you his entire plan yeah so he needs an audience and he's like i'm leaving him alive to enact my revenge via monologue right that makes sense for sure are we going to talk about the gross part that i hate so much yeah, sure. We have to talk about the okay. gross part that I hate so much. So in life, Dr. Carl Hill has a file on Meg oh. with her hair and clippings and all this other stuff. And it and openly creepily flirts with her in front of her dad. And her dad's just like a dumbass, I guess. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> her dad, or the dean in the book, is like this lauded hero who yeah. like, saves a bunch of people from a plague and then succumbs to the plague and then is brought back as like a zombie. But I thought that was interesting that in the movie he's like just like kind of a dick dean and in the book he's like this hero that herbert is like i hate you i'm gonna bring you back to life Mm -hmm. and even in the movie like the act of bringing him back to life is also kind of like a well now i'm in control now sir so he he has this folder with like hair and and clippings and creepy stalker shit yeah creepy stalker shit so we know that he's bad news from the get because she's like 20 right yeah he's john Kerry old (laughs) really is john Kerry's been old (laughs) apologies to 2008 presidential candidate john Kerry. No. 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 No apologies? Okay. <laughs> no apologies. Fuck that guy. I mean, like, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. He gets his head chopped off. He lives. He knocks out Herbert, saving him for an epic monologue. And then he immediately goes and he's like, well, I'm dead. So now there are no consequences. I'm going to kidnap this woman that I love. Love is his word, Obsessed not my word. Obsessed. Obsessed. Yeah. So he kidnaps her. Take mm-hmm. it from here. It's God, your favorite it's, scene. It's you want to talk worst. about this scene. It's the scariest scene in the movie to me. Yeah, he takes her, knocks her out, strips her nate, has a bo- it's like it's played for camp for sure. Right. Like, you know, the body is like bumbling around and the head saying, like, you idiot over here, you know, <laughs> yeah. really farcical shit. But it's really freaking horrifying because it's about to be a sexual assault. Right. They strip her down, tie her to a table, and then the head is- licks her entire body. Blah. The tongue, so much tongue. It's uh, my notes. I just want to read my notes for a second. My notes say, wow, I hate this. Yuck, yuck, yuck. I hate this so much. I'm glad he was brought back so we can kill him again. Ew. I am literally saying ew out loud. <laughs> she is good at screaming, though. <laughs> um, yeah, because the way that the camera is shot, it's, it's a side shot of her laying on the table with her like legs bent and a decapitated corpse head slowly being like brought to give her non-consensual zombie cunnilingus. This scene was... You know, because of sexual assault, obviously. But I have a fear of being restrained and not being able to move, yeah. which is why I'm a top. But also, <laughs> <laughs> that's why this scene was, like, particularly bad for me. Because just, like, the thought of not of someone forcing this on you and not being able to move about it, like, was ju- is just awful. And this is a scene that, like, really stayed with me. Yeah, that's, like, that is a, a truly horrific scene. I did not find this, but Bobby is the king of trivia, and he found this quote. So when David Gale's wife, this is pulled from IMDb, when David Gale's wife first saw the infamous giving head scene. David Gale's being the guy who played Hill? Yes. Mm. His wife, 
stormed out shouting, David, how could you? <laughs> and this story has been confirmed by Stuart Gordon. So like confirmed by the director that this is a thing that happened. So yes, that scene, very fucking upsetting. David, how could you? <laughs> Probably to femme people and to vagina having people yeah. more than anybody because so scary. it falls right in line with all of the, like you said, corpse gags and beheading gags. And like some writers like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if you fucking. But it's like a bunch of dudes it's being horrific. like, let's push the envelope. Right? It's horrific. It's super horrific. But it also plays really strongly specifically into the idea of like a very, you know, genre idea of horror of like complete loss of autonomy, complete loss of your body, being faced with a monstrous monster, literal monster, <laughs> and not being able to fight back. Like yeah. it is it is horrific. And like sexual assault in the real world is horrific. And they whether or not they played it for camp here, like making a monster do it and like really like shining a light on like this is a monstrous act. Like even if he had his head attached and was alive, he's still a monster here. There's something to be said about that, whether they intended that or not. Yeah, and this is the only really actual scary part of the movie for me. That's fair. Yeah. And the fact that it was just all about her. Like, he didn't try to fuck her. He wanted, like, it easily could have been about, but the fact that it was about her and her helplessness. Yeah. That was, that really drove it home. Well, and it's even, even, it's even more perverted because I'm sure in the character of Carl Hill's mind it's like he is doing this out of like love right he's doing something for her like mm -hmm. let me show you how much I grotesquely oh, love you no I'm That's fine horrific. babe this is about you yeah oh. horrific hate it well he gets his because he gets squished yeah he really gets squished one of my favorite things about looking at Bride and Reanimator together is that at the end of Bride theoretically Herbert has been et by a <laughs> a intestine monster Dr. Carl Hill has been squished like mm -hmm. the dean zombie even though he's a, a zombie and has been lobotomized still recognizes I meg love that though that was so nice he defended yeah. his daughter i loved it i will fight through this lobotomy to save your life but he takes carl hill's head and squishes it game of thrones style I love it. which i i read in some kind of interview or saw in some kind of youtube video that it was just like a chunk of hamburger meat with like a wig <laughs> with like a wig on and it was just like squished <laughs> I love props people. Oh, I mean, the props and makeup people in this movie, like, fucking shout out because they are, it's so good. It's so good. Like, I was watching this with another academic friend of mine who, like, commented. Margaret from the Window? Margaret from the Window, <laughs> who is a Bollywood scholar, so is used to critiquing movies, mentioned, like, the that first, you said the Arnold Schwarzenegger stand-in, that first guy that they got, that they reanimated, she, like, said, oh, it's so cool how they, like, did the makeup on his back, like, all the blood settled there. Yeah. Well, because they they did a lot of actual anatomical research for this show. Like, mm -hmm. what would a corpse actually look like? Right. And so I think part of the reason it's so f effective is that it walks that line of fantastical and supernatural and camp horrific. Mm -hmm. And, like, this is actually what a body might look like if it's reanimated. And I think that is really effective in the first movie specifically. Yeah. Do you think it's really funny that at the end, essentially everybody is dead or dying in a certain way, except for Dan? Mm. And then in Bride, it just fucking picks back up and Herbert's alive. <laughs> Herbert's fine. And, and Dr. Carl Hill's a head in a bag, unsquished, and yeah. like Meg's guest dead, I guess, but we got our heart. And like there's no explanation. And I think that that is incredible, actually, and lends to the campiness where it's just like, you just accept it. We're here for a ride. We're not here for like a movie that makes a whole lot of hashtag sense. I especially love it because they did film a scene where they explain it. Yeah, where it picks up at the end of the first movie and Meg is dead. The re reagent didn't work, and Herbert slides in covered in blood and is like, "Yeah, I lived." <laughs> He just surfboards in there. He like yeah. rides the wave of blood. He Hang ten, bro. He literally says something. I, I don't want to look it up verbatim right now, but skateboards he, in. He literally says like, "Yes, I'm alive," or something. <laughs> something really just like bland and very direct. Herbert West. Yes, I'm alive. He Tony yes, Hawk. I live. Pro skater to Ollie's oh, into yeah. the room. 100%. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if the new dean's office also happens to have a padded cell in there. I, they probably just How after convenient. the well after the like uh, the massacre at Midatonic or whatever like they probably have like a bunch just to just to <laughs> just save to, just to be safe. Well, they do in Bride. They have that like scene of 
a padded room with a bunch of people that mm-hmm. like Herbert has like reanimated and stuff, and so they're just like bumbling around, horrific. The the makeup in in two is a lot grosser. Cr- grosser. Yeah, it's scarier for me, definitely fused people together aside like the makeup is a lot more horrific in and less campy in the first one yeah there's a lot more stuff fall stuff coming out of mouths yeah even though everyone has blood you know blood gushing out of their mouth in the first one like the second one has like a variety of substances (laughs) gushing out of people's mouths which is much grosser and i feel like the second one has a lot more of a traditional like zombie feel of like i want to chase and at you (laughs) yeah i think i that's why i like francesca a lot more because she like fights back where else meg just screams well and also francesca immediately writes off dan too and is like what the fuck is happening here? <laughs> and like she stays to try and help and fight, but she is not like swayed by his like Danliness. Mullet. <laughs> his 1990s uh, feathered mullet. Yeah, that was a, a real good mullet though. In Bride 2, it is ridiculous that Carl Hill comes back just as a head. Oh, yeah. Nobody. And he convinces somebody to sew bat wings onto oh, his head. Oh, my God. It reminded me of Connor's chicken bat sketch a lot. Oh, yeah. That'll be linked in our our thing for sure. We will link our friend Connor Cons, who is a drag king, drag queen, who's a drag queen, a drag performer who does this hilarious chicken bat. You can't 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 watch it. it. He's a chicken. He's a bat. It looks a lot like Carl Hill with the bat wings. Yeah. We'll have to ask Connor if they were inspired by the (laughs) Bride of (laughs) Reanimator. But yeah, he's just flapping around, he's flapping around. being awful uh, and Hill. And yeah, I love that they got the actor back just for this. He specifically asked to be in this movie. <laughs> he heard that they were making another one, specifically reached out and said, I would love to be in this movie again. And the director was like, yeah, okay, we'll figure it out. We don't care. I mean, we but brought director, Westy back. We brought Westy back. But the director, too, was like, but I'm not bringing your body back. <laughs> Like, you have to agree to do this. Nobody. Nobody allowed. And he was like, I guess, even though, like, the filming of it, like, a disembodied head is was very uncomfortable for him. But he was like, I had a really good time. And this, like, really broke me out of my actor slump. Because he was a theater actor. And he was like, this, like, campy-ass movie broke me out of my actor slump. And I'd really like to be a part of it again. Oh, I Ple- see that. I yeah. see that he was a theater actor. That makes A lot so of people sense. from this movie were theater actors. Because the director, I think, spe- specifically had a theater company. And they mm-hmm. originally wanted to pitch this movie as a TV show and they actually wrote 13 episodes as a TV show <gasps> and then the the guy who ended up being the director I think let me let me check just give me one quick scroll to the top of my notes yeah there was a comic book there was a rewrite based on the movie so there's been quite a bit out there yeah well the rewrite apparently is like super super, super gay super explicitly gay explicitly gay but also very very homophobic Oh, is it? Yeah, because they make Herbert more explicitly gay, but they make Dan kind of like a dick about it. Also, Dan Mm -hmm. at one point pretends to have AIDS. I remember reading about that. And that's... So I think it's both more explicit, but also making the queerness more explicit. They also make the queerness more villainous in Mm -hmm. the book. So... Makes sense. Fuck that book, I guess. (laughs) But yeah, so Stuart Gordon, Dennis Powley and William Norris wrote 13 episodes and then they pitched it and Brian Usna, who was the producer of this one and then I believe the director of the second one was like, yeah, I think that horror is doing a lot better in movies now. I think that we should pivot and turn this into a movie. And that's what they did. So they just scrapped their 13 episodes of a TV show and turned it into an hour and a half movie, which thinking about that, like, can you imagine this is like a slow build? Thir- like, it's a oh, short no. story. It's a short, like, fun, fast-paced movie. I think that a TV show would, like, 13 episodes is a lot for this. I think Bride is even too long. Like, the first one was the perfect length, I think. It keeps you engaged the whole time. You don't get bored. Bride moved too slow for me, so I can't even imagine this as a TV show. Yeah, Bride has, like, a lot of things that you can cut out and make it. So there's there's good enough moments that I think it's worth a watch, especially the idea of, you know... Herbert being like, I will create a perfect person for you if you just stay. Because before, oh, we didn't even say this. Before Herbert West gives his, like, lady pitch, um, (laughs) Dan is like, I'm moving out. And Herbert's like, hold up. I got the heart of your lover in my hand. Would you like to stay? (laughs) It's very, like, jilted lover breakup. I'm going to move out things. It's very like, no, we can make it work. Here, I'll we'll change. I'll change. I got these ballerina feet. <laughs> <laughs> these this these, these hands thighs. these hands of a lawyer. <laughs> oh, yeah, what was that? 
don't know. In the book, it's a hand, like, murderous, I think. <laughs> Lawyer, murderer, potato, potato. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think this movie is great because it's acted really great and campy and all of the queer readings you can pull from it, the, like, interesting aspect of the adaptation, but also, like, as a movie, as a film, it is also, like, the production and stuff is just really interesting to read about. Not only, like, the 13 episodes into a movie, but the the credits fucking slap. Oh, the credits They're are so, so good. good. They were done by Dawson, Robert Dawson, who fucking rules. Like, he's, well, he's most well-known because he does a lot of Tim Burton's credits, mm. but he did, like, Gone in 60 Seconds, like, Armageddon. Like, he has done... X2, X-Men United, like, this motherfucker has done amazing fucking work. He is, like, the title credits, like, king. And I I never really paid attention to title credits other than, like, being like, oh, wow, this title credit is really neat. And then just doing research about him, I was like, title credit creators are fucking cool. We should talk about them more. Yeah. It was, like, especially in the first – I'm glad that they brought – him back i assumedly either just brought him back or ripped off his style for the second one or just like redid it (laughs) yeah but in the first one i just love the title credits how it like ends by like the eye opening and then us zooming in on the eye like that's just so like chef's kiss i think the way that he combines the idea of the like anatomical drawings and like scientific drawings and then the like neon colors that he uses that's very reminiscent of the reagent itself Mm -hmm. the glow sticks (laughs) is really really great and it pairs really well with the theme song which was written by something band which i just remember. oh yeah band his last name is band because i wrote that it's funny to have the last name band and be a composer (laughs) No, the score works really, really well. The- Richard Band. The whole time when the score is playing, and like they use it for the opening credits, and then they use it throughout the film, I was like, man, this fucking slaps. This is so good. And then doing research and stuff, it's clearly, I guess, to everybody who cares about movies. I mean, I've seen Psycho, but like I'm not like all up on Hitchcock's dick or whatever. So, But it's an homage to the Psycho theme. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of people were like, wow, that sounds a lot like Psycho. It sounds like he ripped it off. And then he was like, yeah, no, that it's like, it's literally. <laughs> yeah, I literally it's, did. I literally did. It's called an homage. Like, it's this a horror, like, what? This what? is horror. Comedy. <laughs> yeah, like. Can't wh- be horror. This is a horror comedy thing. And Hitchcock views Psycho as a comedy. Yeah. So the it's like a it's a it's a great homage and I just think it's funny that lots of people are like, "Wow, this guy really ripped it off." And he was like, "No, I I it's like a I did it on purpose. Also, I added a sick oboe. So like, get out of my face." <laughs> that oboe slips. That oboe slips. <laughs> Also, going for me personally, as the host of this podcast, from The Thing, which was, is an incredible movie, which I think you would, I think you can handle it. You said you've okay. never seen it. I've never seen it. I've never seen so many horror movies. I think the the hard thing about The Thing is the the gore, right? And yeah. it, it, is, it is horrific. But if you can handle the gore in this, you can handle the gore in The Thing. I can, because I was originally, I originally went to school as a special effects makeup artist. And then you were like, icky. Well, I was like... <laughs> No, I was, I was like, more like, I'm living in Cincinnati, icky. And then I moved back. <laughs> so different ick, but much worse, arguably. <laughs> but um, still an ick. Yeah. So if it has cool makeup that is obviously makeup, I'm fine with practical effects and things like that. You have to I'm, watch a thing. Yeah. I'm not fine with things that look real. Yeah. No, you'll be fine. Yeah. I can't watch a lot of the horror movies my wife watches because she watches stuff that looks real and is actually scary. I don't like extreme realistic body horror yeah you'll be fine cool like i can't watch any of the hardcore japanese horror movies those are body horror body horror yeah you can handle the thing i think cool. but going from that where the critics fucking hated it just decimated it fucking hated it they like it was shocking how much they hated it especially because now it's considered like one of the best horror films slash one of the best movies of all time classic. it's not even a cult classic at this point well, i think i would say it still is a cult classic well to me i don't know Anything that plays at the drive-in or plays at the music box at midnight doesn't. Yeah, classic. that's fair. I just think it is it is lauded by critics now as like this is a good movie, like not just like this was good for its time or this ages in a fun way or this is like can be like no, this is a brilliant movie. But like I get what you're saying. Yeah, like it's the same as Rocky Horror. Like it's very common in the zeitgeist now, but it's still a cult classic. Yeah, for sure. 
So that was 1982. This came out in 1985. And critics fucking loved it. And that was very confusing for me. (laughs) I don't know if it's because, like, people went into the thing with such high expectations because they were like, this John Carpenter guy, he's really, like, knocking it out of the woods because he had just come off of Halloween, which was, like, a big thing. And when they walked into Reanimator, they were just like, whatever, whatever. And so their expectations were so low that they were, like, delighted by it. Oh, so they hated the thing. They liked Reanimator. Okay, I got that. Hated the thing. Okay. Loved Reanimator. Obviously, they're very, very different movies, but they both have gore and and horror, whatever. They're and cousins. Maybe, yeah, I guess. The thing is played seriously. This is obviously sure. played for camp, but I just, it was just like whiplash for me to go from, you know, Ebert being like, this is Drek and <laughs> this doesn't make any, like, this is just horror for horror's sake and blah, 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 to going into Reanimator and being like, this is horror for horror's sake and I loved it. And I was like, what is happening? Like, the difference three years could make or maybe the difference of like accepting that it's a comedy or whatever, mm-hmm. it was wild to me. Like, it was critically, like, lauded. Yeah, because it doesn't take itself too seriously. And, like, the actors know that as they're acting. Like, Jeffrey Combs, like, is having so much fun. like Chewing that scenery. Chewing that scenery. His line delivery. Like, his complete, like, straight face. Like, determination. Everyone is in on the joke, and I think that helps a lot. Yeah. Ebert wrote, One of the pleasures of the movies, however, is to find a movie that chooses a disreputable genre and then tries with all of its might to transcend the genre to go over the top into some kind of artistic vision, however weird. And so I guess at this one he was just like, I accept that this is a horror movie and I love how horrific it is, but it's just also so wild because he literally basically said the opposite about the thing three years earlier. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. Yeah. I think it makes a big difference how it's presented and billed. Yeah. He also wrote, I was reminded of Pauline Kael's sane observation, the movies are so rarely great art that if we can't appreciate great trash, there is little reason for us to go. Which makes me, like, I know that you don't have context for this, unless you listened to the podcast before, which you should listen to the podcast before. But he, like, Roger Ebert and other critics were literally like, this is just trash. This is horror trash. Like, we don't want it. But now he's like, oh, if you can't appreciate trash, are you even a critic? Yeah, like, my my favorite media is, like, stuff that is stupid and fun and silly. Pop culture and media is meant, like, I love love it as an escape. Like, I love thinking. Went to grad school, love thinking. I could do without it. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I fucking... (laughs) My favorite shit is the stuff that is just stupid and silly because life is too goddamn serious. I love the CW. I love, like, any... Do you mean the CW, a network that was never profitable? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about That's that afterwards. a different afterwards. podcast. We'll talk about that after, <laughs> afterwards. No, I love, like, stupid, silly shit that's often dismissed because I feel like crit- it's the same thing where, like, comedies this never... dismissed. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> comedies, like, never get Oscars for the same kind of reasons. And, yeah, the fact that this wasn't dismissed is, like, a huge... Th- like, I would not expect critics no. to like this at all. And across the board. Yeah. I mean, nobody gave it, like, five, four stars, but they were like, this is good. I would would see again. Yeah. It's <laughs> Which is crazy to me. Wild. So bananas Anyway, me. I'm buying the CW. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I've raised $25, and so I'm now buying CW. (laughs) I've collected all of my pennies. So before we wrap things up, we have these questions that we kind of have been posing. And so far, the answers have been very obvious, but, like, theoretically, sometime they won't be. So our, like, elemental questions for this series is, is the horror on top of the plot in this movie, or is the plot dependent on the horror? I think the plot is dependent on the horror. Yeah. It's all, I mean, it's all about what they're doing. Right. And his work and reanimators, it's reanimators, reanimating. It's right. about it. The horrific, I think the idea of looking at our bodies as just machines, machines without a soul and being presented by a person in Herbert West that views it that way, like that is horrific, right? That is his impetus to create the reagent regardless of if it worked or brought the zombies to life or whatever, that is the real horror here. Mm-hmm. So, like, his his plot, his life plot, uh, sure, which is God. a pun because you get it? Grave robbing? His life plot is <laughs> is horrific. Therefore, the plot is, like, dependent on the horror. Yes. Do the horror elements add or subtract to this movie? Oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> it is it. it. That's what it is. It is. Yeah, you can't separate it. No, you can't. Especially when we talk about how funny it is, like the deadpanness of Herbert West is 
kind of only works because of the fantastical, ridiculous shit that's happening around him. Mm -hmm. Like to be able to be calm and be like, Dan, look out. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I'll never let it go. It's the funniest line for me. He never, like, oh man, I, he never cracks. He He just sticks with it the whole damn time. Okay. This is a question just for, for reanimator. Okay. Do you think Herbert killed the cat or was the cat dead? Like Herbert said. I, oh, I, it's seeing, watching reanimator along with Bride. I think he killed it with the casual way that he killed the iguana because I don't think he views animals as on the same level as people. Yeah. Like he was so casual about killing with that iguana. With his weird magic chloroform dust. Yeah. With his, <laughs> yeah. With, he doesn't, he views animals as like means to an end test subjects. And he like views people as that too. But the ration, like the moral conflict isn't even there for animals, I think. For yeah. Him. And the way that he described the cat dying is ridiculous. Yeah. But there is, like, I think there is an argument to be made of, like, but he cares about Dan, and Dan cares about the cat. It's true. Dan cares about the cat, but, you like, like in the article we read, like, he has to bring Dan in somehow, and he That's has to true. show. And in Herbert's Th- mind, he's not even killing the cat. He's going to bring it back to life, so That's he never true. killed it in the first place. That is that is how he lures Dan in. He's right. like, I will bring your kitty cat back to life. <laughs> Let me bring that kitty cat back Let to life. <laughs> and that is another queer reading. <laughs> but don't expect it to, to do a tango. It's bag is broken. Oh, that's such a good line. <laughs> that's such a good line. It's so good. Yeah, Dan's the perfect person to help him. I wrote in my notes, you're the perfect person to help me. You're hardworking and also sexy. Like, he had to get, he had to entice you. And also, Dan you have somehow. nice hair. Yeah. Nice I think hair. you would look great with a little blanket thrown over you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you clomped onto that so much. I just love, I just love blankets. <laughs> yeah, I just love blankets. Okay, before we totally like move out and wrap up, I think we do have to talk about the fact that H.P. Lovecraft sucks, yeah, right? Like he's a shit. bad dude. He's a piece of shit. Like I've never read H.P. Lovecraft before. This was my first thing reading of him, and like it's hard when you want to read and know like source text and foundational text and because then you can see how it's subverted and transgressed. And I think that is the compelling thing about reading Lovecraft today, even knowing he was a piece of shit. Like we were talking about in the Discord, which you can join at patreon.com slash NYD Productions for only a dollar. Uh, we were having a conversation in our Spooky 30 chats and Duncan was like, Reanimator is one of those movies which is way better than the source book, mostly because it cut out the racist parts. And Tim responded, he was like, the best part of Lovecraft is that it's public domain now and it can be made queer and inclusive. And you see that subversion here, right? Like, I don't think H.P. Lovecraft would be a big fan of this movie. He would be a big <laughs> fan of us talking about it. Either yeah. like this and being like, I want them to kiss. <laughs> but it would a blanket on it. I would argue that <laughs> I would argue that the first movie doesn't entirely cut out the racism like the only black characters we see are like the security guard who's like shown as being pretty incompetent like he literally like a pervert yeah he literally goes to like jerk off with a magazine when he's on shift and then the orderlies who are taking care of the dean like right so they're and one of the at least one of the zombies reanimated is a person of color yeah so those are the only people of color that we see in the first movie in the second movie like what like the main scientist yeah. Is the black man. But so he's also presented as kind of incompetent. Yeah, he is. So it doesn't, it's not as explicit. Right. For sure. It's not great, but it's not awful. Right. The, the, in the novella, there's some like rough parts. Really, uh, rough, really rough. Specific, like specifically racist against black people and also pretty classist. But that's a thing. The classism stuff, it, when you think about this story and Frankenstein, which is, like, arguably a source material for this. Like, it's hard to escape (laughs) Frankenstein, right? Like, even though one of the people that I read was like, well, I don't think that uh, H.P. Lovecraft was influenced by Frankenstein because, like, he brings back full bodies. And it was like, okay, he obviously... You don't think H.P. Lovecraft read Mary Shelley? Like, get, shut up. <laughs> like, Lovecraft actually, like, he said that it was yeah. a sub based on Lovecraft. Her yeah, Lovecraft was, like, a sickly weird kid who read a bunch of books. So, like, he definitely read this book. Yeah. But Frankenstein, the character of Frankenstein, Dr. Victor Frankenstein, leads this, like, blessed life, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think we read it in the article. The um, Soul of the Matter, Frankenstein meets H.P. Lovecraft's Herbert West Reanimator by Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock. And, like... They, he talks about how Frankenstein had, like, tons of male privilege, white privilege. Right. He's rich. Yeah. Everybody loves him. He's got a best friend who will who literally dies for him. He's got, like, a wife picked out since he was a kid. He fucks off to school and is like, 
he is so full of hubris, right? And it's like, I can do whatever I want. And he goes grave robbing and he like works in a butcher shop or like gets a laboratory in a butcher shop and stuff. And the idea of me as a rich person, me as a rich like white person can use the bodies of like lower class people mm-hmm. even when they're dead. Poor people can't escape the machinations of rich people even when they're dead because their bodies are still viewed as like material. He never saw them as people to begin with. Right. They're just parts, right? Yeah. They're just They've parts for him. And, parts. And, and Herbert West, too. Like, it's just parts. Like, mm-hmm. he doesn't view anybody as a person other than himself and, like, arguably Dan. <laughs> like, that's it. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Everybody else is just parts. And so I think that that classes thing is really interesting when thinking about this adaptation and the story and these characters. This is transgressive from Lovecraft stuff in a way where we talk about the queerness and stuff. But it, it doesn't, like, other than not being explicitly racist, it doesn't, like, fix the racism like the the story and the source material is like just going to be a racist story Mm -hmm. actually it is i think it's in the other article playing god without a merry male fantasy in frankenstein and herbert west reanimator alexander coley talks again about like the dangers of the unchecked male ego yeah which is very that like the violent no specifically the violent consequences of an unchecked male ego like you know these little boys are having tantrums because they're like toys don't work Right. And that goes back to the idea of like we are also creating I want to create life without a a woman because like I'm a man and I should be able to do everything. Exactly. I should be able to (laughs) literally be God. Yeah. Myself without any woman present. With no consequences. (laughs) Fun. Fun. Okay. Closing out. We have to close out with uh, Peg Mary Kill (laughs) via (laughs) our... Our uh, bestie and listener, Jolene, uh, this one is obvious, but like uh, you can't just say you have to give your your reasonings, right? So Herbert West, Dan Kane, Carl Hill. <laughs> oh, my God. Kill Hill and then bring him back and then kill him again. And then incinerate him so and he can't come back. And then Well, just do it over and over. Peg Herbert, because he would be a little freak. Marry Dan because he's a bimbo and bimbos make the best husbands. See, I would kill Carl Hill. I don't. Uh, if you would, West would be a nightmare to be married to. I would kill or I would peg Dan because I really do think that he needs it. <laughs> he does. He really needs it. He needs some guidance in his life. He is off the rails. He needs a finger up the butt. He needs it. I would marry Herbert with the with knowing that he – this is completely sexless. He does not want to be married to me. I don't want to be married to him. <laughs> and I will definitely end up as a corpse. But if I married Dan, I feel like I would get – murdered and experimented on more because Herbert would be mad that I was there fucking with Dan. But if I just am around Herbert, he might just get annoyed and murder me semi-nicely and bring me back semi-nicely and not do a weird, like, temper tantrum experiment on me. That's fair. So in this situation, I know I'm going to die, but I'm choosing which one which may be, like, less horrific for me (laughs) because I cannot put myself in a situation where I will be fused with another person. That's fair. (laughs) I just can't get past how much of a nightmare it would be to be married to Herbert West. Well, I think it would only be like a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I feel like it would be a short, 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 short lived. And hopefully he like reanimates me. It's horrific. But then he like just throws me in the incinerator and I'm done. <laughs> that is. Fair. Respect. That, that is what I'm looking at here. Respect. Wait, any more thoughts before I send you on your merry way? I'm very happy that you like this movie and you got over your zombies. Well, we're not totally over it. We got it, yeah. a little bit over <laughs> zombies. You mentioned wanting a, like, if you like this, then yeah. recommend that. And I do have something to recommend with the caveat that it is incredibly problematic. Okay. Very problematic. I mean, lots of horror is. No, so. but like, especially this one. Like, Are you going to say Frankenhooker? I'm going to say Frankenhooker. <laughs> I'm going to say Frankenhooker, which is such a fun movie and so problematic <laughs> in a specifically 80s way. Okay. But incredibly fun. And right. I think that if it like they go hand in hand, I feel like they're like of the same family. Okay. I will check it out and and let you know. With the knowledge. Or I'll just watch it with you. Yeah. No, let's watch it (laughs) together. I was going to be her for Halloween many years. She's awesome. I mean, theoretically, Halloween's will happen again. So Uh, keep the dream alive. Uh, Fingers crossed. (laughs) All right. 
Give the people your socials before I kick you out. My social security number. Is- <laughs> <laughs> no, I am on Instagram as Rosemary Maybe. I don't post much except for my stories where I'm posting like weird bullshit fan stuff and my cats. That's pretty much it. I'm not doing much because I'm, you know, trying to stay alive like yeah, the rest of us. Pandemi. Hey. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for being on this podcast. Thank you for having me. This is real fun. I'll see you later when we watch Frank Hooker. You'll never get credit for my discovery. Who's going to believe a talking head? Get a job in a sideshow. And now it's time for Nightmare Corner with producer Bobby Hoffman. I've been here the entire time. Okay, I'm going to play this nightmare with a caveat that this was recorded like a month ago and is has nothing to do with this movie, but does have to do with a different movie we've talked about. Okay, so you hadn't watched Reanimator yet? No. Okay, cool. I did technically sort of have a Reanimator nightmare, but I forgot to record it. But it was not totally a Reanimator nightmare. I watched Reanimator, and then I watched Ginger Snaps, which is a movie I love, and I've also been watching a lot of Teen Wolf. <laughs> and I had this dream. I can't really remember it, but... It had to do with like, I was like definitely on a my period and it was like a heavy period and I was also digging up a grave. <laughs> so take that as you <laughs> Did you know that you were on your period just internally? Oh no, like... it was like fully Okay, like, all right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Ginger snaps going down the leg type situation. Gotcha. Okay, okay. <laughs> so it was like a amalgamation of a lot of things happening. But there was grave robbing in it. So I think it does tie to Reanimator. <laughs> it's under the umbrella, definitely. Okay. But let's listen to this nightmare that has nothing to do with Reanimator. It's 7.30 in the morning. Okay, this one was weird. I was at my grandma's house, and Nick was there, and we had our cats. But we were treating them kind of like dogs, like, like they were on a trip with us. And I had the two cats I have now, and I had... A cat from childhood boy who was so cute and fat and that was the best part i miss him anyways so we are at the house and i'm doing something and one of the cats gets outside into the garden so i'm like oh okay and then there's like a stray dog and i'm like oh shit we gotta help this dog so i'm like getting the dog and then another dog comes and I'm like, oh, two stray dogs, that's crazy. And I put one of the stray dogs in the, like, um, screened-in porch. And then I'm like, well, the other one I'll just leave on the deck and I'll go get food. And as I'm trying to close the door, the, like, dog puts his head in the, you know, dogs put their heads, like, in the, you know, you're trying to close their door. And they're like, hey, I'm a big dumb dummy, here's my head. Um, So the dog does that in the door frame, and the dog looks like, Alexander Skarsgård's it, but as a dog, doesn't do anything, doesn't try and kill me or anything, but just like fucking stares at me with its fucking dog face, and I'm like terrified, and in my head and in the dream, I'm like, no, 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 this is a fucking dog, that's not real, this is a fucking dog, don't kick this dog in the face, just gently push its fucking head out, and I did that, and it took forever, and he was just smiling at me with his big fucking buck teeth, it was scary. And then I was like, I'm going to make food for the dogs. I don't have any dog food because I'm at grandma's. So I made like rice and cut up some chicken or something. And then I also tried to cut up a bunch of gold jewelry specifically for the it one. Because I was like, I got to feed it gold. I don't know. Then I went to feed it and it was gone. And that was it. So belated it nightmare. Ho, ho, mama dog. <laughs> we all float down here to a spell. <laughs> I don't know why I was like, gotta feed it gold. <laughs> it's dream logic. It's dream logic. You don't have to look into that. I'm not a person who... Oh, I don't want anyone to interpret these Really, things. really looks into the symbolism of dreams. Yeah. I really don't want anybody to interpret the I'm on my period grave digging dream. <laughs> we don't need any of... No, no. We're good. We're good. We both pay people... <laughs> To therapize us. We don't need help in that regard. I just thought it was funny that I had an it dream several... And it was scary because, like, imagine Alexander Skarsgård's, like, bug teeth being, like, in the door frame. Here's Johnny style. Like, I'm a dog now. Especially... <laughs> At grandma's house. So overtly referential to something. I say anytime you get a loose thread like that, please bring it in. Yeah, I mean... We got to have something for the Nightmare Corner, right? 
<laughs> it's going to evolve. Your nightmares are going to evolve just like this podcast every single episode. Yeah, it's it's happening. Definitely. <laughs> Okay, well, after that trauma, <laughs> how about we get into the next section, which is, of course, our Lollipop Man scale. <laughs> oh, Lollipop Man. I mean, Reanimator's not scary. It's it, it walks that line of horror comedy, right? Like, lots, even really scary horror movies have funny moments, like horror and comedy, it's all about transgressing the normal whether it's sure. in like a funny way or if it's in like a horror way and in your body has big reactions to it right like horror you're like tight and well and then once it's released it's like this big flood of adrenaline or it's know, an orgasm right a spooky orgasm yeah another good band name. <laughs> <laughs> that is my gay dancing cover band anyways <laughs> <laughs> so this is horror comedy right that's Absolutely. just what it is so it's not scary but i would give it a three Probably because it is grotesque. Sure. And like, I wouldn't want anybody to walk into it and be like, oh, it only got a one on the lollipop man scale. <laughs> like, it is <laughs> grotesque. And also thinking about, you know, it makes you think about the nature of life and your soul. And the sexual assault scene is hard to watch. So I think it it deserves spooky lollipop credit for being super transgressive and gross in a lot of ways of how it views physiology and man yeah. in, in general there's a lot of connection there with the thing of just we're all parts we're all just matter here to right. be manipulated yeah that is horrific in and of itself yeah and then jumping off of that even though you've been having infused nightmares and this wasn't overtly horrific in a tone and build-up way but it did have a lot of horrific images in it mm -hmm. if there's one mental image that sticks with you about i think you broke down each of these movies yeah um well shocker he put a little blanket on him yeah of course of course of course of course that's, <laughs> that's the yeah. scene that yeah. i will be thinking about forever until i die yeah because lol well, i think blankets are romantic and i do ship these characters blah 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 whatever but also the fact that this sweet quiet moment happens in the middle of carnage yes is shocking and is it, it does that thing that good horror does where it like whiplashes you right you really you just saw a zombie come to life a dude get choked the zombie have its heart ripped out by a little buzzsaw like it it all of this fucking happens it's violent and messy and bloody and then this like quiet sweet moment manipulative moment it does that whiplash, and that is, to me, what good horror does. It, like, jerks you around so you can't be settled, even if it's funny or whatever. Like, you shouldn't feel settled watching a horror movie, even if it's not scaring you. It's also what good subversive comedy does. Yeah. The punchline comes out of nowhere that, it, within all of that gore and chaos, this mad scientist character has this tender little moment. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I get that, definitely. In the story, I would say, at the end... Herbert is like ripped apart by his creations and the narrator, the unnamed narrator, best friend, lover, whatever, however you want to read it, has this line where he says, as it disappeared, I saw that the blue eyes behind the spectacles were hideously blazing with their first touch of a frantic visible emotion. And so the idea that it took Herbert West to be literally ripped apart to have a reaction that was like, oops, <laughs> maybe... The uh, consequences to my actions are not worth it. <laughs> it. Definitely stood out for me. In the 1990 Bride of Reanimator movie, the whole scene, the like pitch scene, right? Sure, sure. Dan coming in being like, I'm moving out. Herbert being like, I'm literally presenting you the heart of your lover as a proposal almost. And let me, and th like that part is big. But then the like car salesman pitch of the body, frankly, to, you know, I joked about it, but he like, these ballerina feet and these whore's legs and these lawyer hands and the head of the patient that, you know, that you imprinted on because you couldn't save her. And the way he pitches and he has like this very gentle voice, the way that he weaponizes the pillow talk, like that scene is both funny because of like the... the uh, Ridiculousness. Yeah, the ridiculousness, proposed, yeah. The, the, the writing, the like, you know, the lawyer's hand stuff, like... Is funny, but it's it's uncomfortable too because it's it's not funny, <laughs> you know. Like it really walks that line, and I think 
depending on your mood when you want if you want when you watch it you could have a different reaction to that scene each time so like definitely 100 percent that and in the 2003 movie i don't know because i never saw it because it doesn't exist <laughs> though there is one good part where like herbert gives this other prisoner his rat back and herbert's very smug because he kills the rat and then he brings the rat to life but he also like invented a soul or something i don't know and then he gives the rat back and they're trying to kill him and he's like Here's your fucking rat. And then he just walks away unafraid. And one of my favorite tropes in any media is when somebody is completely unafraid walking into a situation where they should be really, really afraid, (laughs) especially if there's somebody who, like, is not read as somebody who is, like, scared or to be feared, right? He is somebody who is, like, small of stature and, like, nobody's scared of him, especially in, like, a prison yard. And he just zero fears it. And it's very good. It's, like, one good scene in a shitty movie. (laughs) In a movie that doesn't exist. In a movie that doesn't. If that movie were to exist, that scene would probably be okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Everyone loves a, oh, fuck. What's the movie? What's the rat guy? Ratatouille? No. No, 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 no. (laughs) The the Crispin Glover one? Yes, 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 yes. I don't know. Crispin Glover Willard. Willard, Willard, yeah. Willard the rat guy. (laughs) Everyone loves a Willard moment. There we go. Everybody loves a Willard. Honestly, the crossovers between Crispin Glover and Jeffrey Combs. Would you fuck Crispin Glover? Crispin Glover? No. Yeah, too spooky, right? I, I think he would try to like breathe in my ear in that like staggered way, and it would give me weird ASMR tingles, and I would freak out. I think the biting would go too far. <laughs> <laughs> Rosemary's still in the room. Rosemary, would you fuck Crispin Glover? <laughs> oh God, I would fuck Christian Christian Slater, but not Crispin Glover. Okay, those are, are very different. They vibes. are the same in my brain. Wow, no. <laughs> I mean, they're right next to. They're, Alphabetically, really, clo- they're really close with one another in like, like the <laughs> Rolodex like, of dudes. I need to look up Crispin Glover again. Wait, Crispin Glover. He's uh, in Charlie's oh, Angels. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. He's we spooky. Got there. I would fuck Willem Dafoe, and I feel like he has a That's similar the- vibe. No. He's like Willem Dafoe or similar six. Yeah, I got vibes. <laughs> okay, turn my <Michael>. go. <laughs> Well, after that, I don't think we could go anywhere else but wrapping this up. So (laughs) speaking of horror, I will now leave and you will have to wrap this episode up yourself. Thank you for listening to the third episode of the seminal podcast, Spooky 30s. I'm still figuring it out. It's very hard to be a host without Aaron. (laughs) But thank you for listening. If you want to check out Rosemary, just remind her her Instagram is Rosemary Maybe. You'll see me pop up every once in a while because we do lots of duets and bullshit together. So it's another way to get content from me. Sneaky, sneaky. And then if you want to follow the podcast, you can follow NYD Productions on Twitter and Instagram and interact with this podcast specifically using the hashtag Spooky 30s. Like I said before, if you want to get sneak peeks of what we're talking about or are watching, you can join our Discord via our Patreon, patreon.com slash NYD Productions. You can pledge for as little as a dollar or as many as a million dollars. <laughs> Just kidding. But it gets you access to our Discord in which we talk about a bunch of spooky stuff. And that's it. Next time, I'm very excited for next time, because next month is February, which means that it's Valentine's Day. So we needed to have a romantic horror movie. So I will be joined with my guest, Elle Collins, where we'll watch the Hellraiser series. (laughs) You know, that very romantic movie. (laughs) Elle is very funny because they pitched this, and I was like, oh, that's supposed to have, like, love elements. (laughs) And they were like, not really. And I was like, I'll make it work. (laughs) Trust me, I will make it work. (laughs) In the meantime, you can follow me at Cell underscore Cheeks on Twitter. After 30 plus years of getting over my fears, monsters just make me horny now. Goodbye. Spooky 30s is created by Stella Cheeks and produced by Bobby Hoffman for NYD Productions. Our show theme is made by Resonate underscore Music, and our show art is by Lauren Moran. 